Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Veruz, again for being here with us. And thank you, especially Amit, for uh, being uh, Professor Amit, for being here um, and for joining us in this debate. Uh, we are very happy to receive you here uh, today. So for the this uh, workshop is part of the initiative of the uh, SAGE, which is the College of Global Studies. Uh, and it is a forum that where we aim to critically debate the process of globalization, identifying the main problems of the contemporary world uh, as uh, a starting point for the, for the discussion. Uh, we privilege historical and interdisciplinary perspectives, and this college highlights the crucial contributions of forms of thought and knowledge offered by the social sciences and humanities, and also by the arts. Uh, and we actually also want to promote international and transnational collaborations like we are doing here today with uh, New Zealand, with Australia, with the Pacific peoples, um, and to have um, you know, these connections with communities of the global south uh, and to, to open the debate to the general public, so uh, a broader audience. Today we have with us uh, Beruz Bruschani, uh, it was for some of you that already saw and heard this lecture yesterday, you already know him, but perhaps there are people that weren't uh, yesterday at lecture. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Veris Bushani. He's a Kurdish Iranian writer, journalist, scholar, cultural advocate, and filmmaker. Uh, he's a joint associate professor in social sciences at the University of New South Wales in Australia graduated from Tarbiat Mohalem University and Tarbiat Modares University, both in Tehran. He holds a master's degree in political science, political geography and geopolitics, uh, and he is a non-resident uh, visiting scholar at the Sydney Asia Pacific Migration Center. He is a, an honorary member of Penn International uh, and the winner of Amnesty International Australia Media Award in 2017 the Diaspora Symposium Social Justice Award, the Liberty Victoria 2018 MT Chair Award, and the Anna Politovskaya Award for Journalism. So Beruz wrote the book No Friends But the Mount No Friend But the Mountains, translated to Portuguese by Casa das Letras with the title Sozinho nas Montanhas, uh, for which he won the prestigious Australian 2019 Victorian Prize for Literature, in addition to the non-fiction category for the book. In 2022, with the translators and editors Omid Tufigian and Moon Mansovi, he published Freedom, Only Freedom, the Prison Writings of Beruz Bushani, that features his collected writings and essays from experts uh, in several areas, refugees, migration, border policies, etc. Um, these two books are at the library, the Sage Library, when you if you are curious to, to read uh, one day. So, um, and also Beruz was a political prisoner uh, incarcerated by the Australian government in Papua New Guinea for almost seven years. Uh, in November, 2019, Beruz escaped to New Zealand. Uh, he now resides in New Zealand um, uh, where he has, you know, was granted um, political asylum. So uh, today he's again with us to, to discuss his work. Um, together with Omid, who has been a collaborator, a friend, a colleague. Uh, he's uh, an award-winning lecturer, a researcher, and community advocate, combining philosophy with interest in citizen media, popular culture, displacement, and discrimination. Omid Tofigen is an adjunct lecturer at the School of Arts and Media of the University of New South Wales, an honorary Research Fellow at Birbeck Law at the University of London, a faculty at Iran uh, Academia, campaign um, manager for Why is My Curriculum White in Australasia. He contributes uh, to co community arts and cultural projects and collaborates with refugees, migrants, and youth. Uh, his publications include Myth and Philosophy in Platonic Dialogues, edited by Paul, published by Paul Gray. Uh, he translated Beruz Bushani multi-award winning novel, No Friend But the Mountains, uh, writings from Minus Island, Minus Prison, sorry. He is also the co-editor, as I mentioned before, 
of, uh, of the book, um, Freedom Only Freedom, and also of special issues for several journals and uh, articles that he wrote together with Verus um, on topics that they will now also discuss. So most importantly, this was a, a very difficult um, way for us. We've been exchanging uh, emails and correspondence for one year because Verus was going to come in April. But because of issues of uh, passports and visas, which are <laughs> impeding us from, you know, crossing the borders easily, so it's very uh, important for us in, because of that that we finally have uh, Professor Omito Figian and Berus here to, today to um, present their work. So I give the floor to you. Uh, I imagine. Yeah. So Omit starts. Omit. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you to um, the center. Thank you to the university. Um, uh, hi, Behruz. It's wonderful to be here with you. And hi to everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, first of all, uh, in line with the um, the theme or the, the title of this, uh, this seminar, uh, Creative Resistance Against the Border Industrial Complex, there are a number of things I think are really worth talking about. Um, and the second part, uh, representing and translating the Manus Nauru prison narratives, will come a little bit later. But Behruz, I think it will be really important to really clarify what we mean by what we mean by the border industrial complex. Um, the border industrial complex is um, very similar to the way people talk about the um, uh, the prison industrial complex and also the um, uh, the military industrial complex. So the border industrial complex uh, is really the way that different kinds of corporations uh, align with the media, with politicians, with policymaking, with civil society to create this particular kind of uh, regime that we see now operating throughout the world. And it's, it's very unique, I think, very special that it actually combines the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex together. Now, um, and also what's extremely important is that the border industrial complex is not just about the people who are suppressing about opp uh, oppression of refugees. It's also uh, uh, it relates to um, supporters of refugees, people who are trying to contribute to the change, people who are showing solidarity. Uh, unfortunately, in so many ways, we have to accept the fact that we are in many ways uh supporting refugees and working against refugees because we're all functioning operating within this border industrial complex so we can talk about that a little bit more later but i'll allow behrus to comment and then we can go to the next screen yeah thank you omid uh, i think uh, yesterday i mentioned that but i think it's very important that when we talk about this industry we in australia that we should know that how this industry is big that is important uh, and who is getting benefit of this uh, regime uh, Australia according to Guardian uh, they spend 14 billion dollars on this uh, industry over the past uh, 10 years and most of this money actually goes to uh, security companies like uh, GeForce uh, uh, the Serco, so probably you know some of these companies, they are international companies, uh, Paladin, and another company which is a medical company called uh, IHMS. Uh, and uh, they spend this money uh, on the, the Manus Island in Nauru and also within Australia, the detention industry in Australia. Uh, and also on the ocean, on the border. So that is the money they uh, spend. So we are talking about a huge industry. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting that when we are talking about industry, that means uh, creating change or changing this policy is really, I don't say impossible, but it's very difficult. I compare it to the law uh, the, that uh, exists in America about having gun. Mm -hmm. So we know that there is a public demand to create change, but it's difficult because the companies 
uh, actually have power, still have power, and they cannot create change because it is an industry. So in Australia, it's like that. There is an industry. They build many detentions. They build many prisons, and many people are working in uh, this industry, like as a uh, nurse, doctor, psychologist, uh, uh, guards. You know, the many people are working, and uh, it's quite interesting that Australia, for keeping this industry alive. What they need, they need some bodies. <laughs> they need refugees. Mm -hmm. And uh, always they find an excuse or the policy makers, you know, not that we are talking about this. Most of refugees, actually everyone in Nauru and Manus uh, already released. Only 60 people remain in Port Mosby. So it seems that we don't have refugees, but this industry still continues. How they, that works, they uh, actually uh, arrest people, refugees who are already free in the community for a very small excuse. They just, or they arrest them and they put them in the detention. Or they target uh, foreigners. So to just keep, uh, to support or feed this uh, industry. So that's why, uh, the, you know, when we talk about industry, that means uh, really creating change or become more uh, complex. And Omid mentioned about the refugee supporters. It's quite interesting. In Australia, there are many organizations who are supposed to help refugees and work for refugees. But uh, one of the things that I and Omid, we talk about quite a lot, that why these uh, people who are fighting against, against this system, they don't follow the money, why they don't target those companies. That is one of the things that I really I don't have an answer for that, because people just talk about the government and they don't target those companies. Yeah, so that is a... Uh, one of the like a paradox in Australia, yeah. Thank you, Behruz. I think um, what you've really pointed out is key to uh, the the point we want to make uh, in this presentation in this seminar. And I, I think for me, what's important is that I don't. Uh, I want to present the 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 situation in a way that acknowledges the overarching nature, the overpowering nature of the border industrial complex, the way it pervades so much of, um, of politics and economy and uh, society and culture and the, the media. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge that there are extremely radical and in influential uh, expressions of freedom that exist within this border industrial complex it's not in uh, it's not such that uh, everyone is consumed completely and there is no way opportunity to crack this system to break this system there are really special moments of freedom that if they're leveraged in the right way suddenly we can see um avenues or um frames uh, uh, or or kind of uh, entry points for making radical sustainable transformation. And here I wanna talk about um, creative resistance and how creative resistance can do so much, so much that even I think uh, uh, what Behruz mentioned about the um, the uh, refugee support organizations, the, the, they haven't been able to do. Creative resistance from the ground, from inside, from grassroots, has actually made some important headways. And Behruz's book, No Friend But the Mountains, is one of them. The film, Choker, Please Tell Us the Time, is another. And I'm also going to re refer to the work done by women in Nauru, in particular, Ella Hezivardar, who, uh, it, you know, you can see up the top, It's there's a um, uh, an image of a 3D model that she created of the Nauru Detention Center um, because of her skill as an architect and an engineer and an, an artist, and also images that she took and uh, an archive that she's collected. So there's there's all of these different examples of creative resistance that are cracking 
the border industrial complex in ways that are unexpected, in ways that even the system wasn't prepared for. And here we have moments of freedom. So here there's um, uh, images from um, my visit to Manus Island, where, where um, you know, on one of my four visits to Manus, uh, we took these images and we have um, uh, examples just to show people what the situation was like, what the environment was like. And I'll go through these quite quickly because we can discuss them in detail later. Here is, uh, again, uh, uh, examples of Behruz's work. Issues such as um, uh, literary experimentation, shared philosophical activity, anti-colonialism, horrific surrealism. These are things that we will come back to as examples of, of, of how this kind of freedom expresses itself. I'll hand it over to um, Behruz now before I go on to the other screens to comment on this use of creative um, creative resistance and how it's been able to do things that other forms haven't been able to do. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so Omid shared those works. They are just some part of this, uh, like, body of works. Uh, we have many, like, uh, music as well that people mostly, when they release from Manus, they release their work and uh, painting. Uh, and also, uh, we recently, last year, actually, two years ago, we published a journal uh, that I and Omid and... Uh, Janet Galbraith and Hani Abdul, we uh, edited a journal that in that journal, uh, we uh, collected uh, like a prison writing by people, you know, detainees in Indonesia, in Naro, in Manus and in Australia. And some of these works were quite interesting that they, are, they were written by kids you know, some of them were like 16 years old, 17 years old, and they wrote these works uh, inside the prison camp, you know. And for example, I referred to a letter or a poem that uh, uh, a girl with like 16 years old that she wrote for her mom and she missed her mom. I think that is really important that uh, we see that uh, system in the uh, perspective of uh, detainees and that detainee can be a uh, like a teenager you know so it doesn't need that they be professional writers uh, or artists but what is important is that how uh, they, uh, they express themselves and they uh, some of their works represent some particular moments and through this work, we have access to that moment. We can imagine it, you know. So uh, all of these works uh, that we have is like a, a big, uh, like body of work uh, created a, like a resistance knowledge. I think that is really uh, important. One of the things that I am still upset about is when I was in Manus Island. So one of the like a uh, project that I wanted to do, but unfortunately I didn't, you know, but I should mention it, that when they send us to Manus Island, uh, I could see that uh, some kids, they were, they wrote uh, on the wall in the prison, everywhere they wrote something. And for example, one of them wrote a letter to God, you know, and, he finished his letter by like a uh, kiss kiss. That's when I kiss you, God. Uh, th that works, I, I had the plan to collect those works because it's really important. But uh, unfortunately, we missed that opportunity because of some reasons. But uh, generally, these works, uh, I think, uh, are important. They are uh, we say that we recorded the part of history, but actually I'm not really happy with that, but I say it because uh, that system still continues. So in when the system continues, we really are not allowed to say that we are, uh, we collected this work or we created these works for future, for the next generation, you know? Uh, that's uh, but uh, 
that the fact is that we recorded this part of history in Australia. But this knowledge that I'm talking about is like a knowledge that uh, created by marginalized people, you know, uh, or probably the most marginalized community in the in Australia, which are refugees, uh, that uh, is uh, it's a knowledge that we I call it uh, history from down to up, you know. And uh, so these works are a part of that. But this uh, photo I should mention that is a part of the film. Uh, choke up list the last time, so they are local kids. Yeah, they are not refugees. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to explain a little bit about um, this image, um, and and then show you uh, uh, the trailer to choke up. Please tell us a time to give people a better sense of the kind of living conditions that were created for refugees in the original camp. So, what I think is special about this image, this still from the movie, is that it really represents paradox, contradiction. It also represents the surreal or absurd nature of the environment there, of the prison environment. Uh, and also it relates to uh, the use of um, psychological horror or horror realism that is combined with that surreal uh, environment, that surreal nature. So in the previous slide, I talked about literary experimentation, or maybe we can say creative experimentation, the shared philosophical activity, uh, anti-colonialism, and horrific surrealism. So all of these are features of this kind of collaboration. You know, the fact that so much of what we were doing was experimental. You know, this is a neo-colonial experiment that's taking uh, uh, place here. And in, to, in order to combat it, we need to be equally experimental in challenging and trying to change things in order to make cracks in the system. We need collective action. A shared philosophical activity is needed, not just to change the material situation, but also the epistemic. Of course, acknowledging the colonial nature of these particular forms of violence. And again, the horrific and the surreal combined. So you, that's really depicted well in this image, I think. Here again, uh, an, a, an image from the movie, uh, and here they're talking about the history of colonialism in Manus Island. Before I go on to the, the next part of this talk, I want to show the trailer to, um, to Choker, please tell us the time. So going back to what I was saying before about um, 
uh, the kind of different experimental and the collective kind of work that was done in order to make this sort of work, in order to make this kind of change. I've listed a number of things here that relates to translation and No Friend But The Mountains. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go through all of them, but I want to really point out the weaponization of time, the weaponization of identity, the weaponization of space, and the weaponization of design. And he, maybe Behruz, I'll allow you some time to talk about these kinds of weaponizations. Uh, and then I'll uh, talk about the kind of work being done from Nauru, the kind of resistance yeah. being done in from Nauru. Behruz? Yeah. So I just go for uh, time. I think it's very important. So how this system uh, used time as a, like a weapon or as a uh, the heart of this uh, systematic torture. Uh, so in Australia, in that uh, industry, so the time is really a key point. Uh, the whole system design on uh, like uh, uncertainty. So people, the, the detainees, they uh, they never tell detainees that how long uh, they are in detention. So it can be for a year, it can be for two years, it can be for 10 years. And uh, that's uh, even the, they gave power to the minister in Australia to keep people in indefinite detention forever. So that is a law in Australia. So the prime the minister can is has this power to keep a detainee in detention forever and in that system, the detainee cannot actually go to court and uh, complain about it. So, and the minister doesn't have to explain. So that is the like endless power that they have. So all of this power is on based of time. So that is really important that what is different between a prison a, a normal prison that we know and uh, detention industry in Australia is time. That is the big difference because a prisoner in a normal prison uh, know that when how long yeah stay in prison, a year, five years, 10 years. But in that uh, system, they never share that. And it's, it's everything is a, uh, on base of like random. Even the way they banished us to Manus Island Naru, it was just randomly. They just uh, asked computer to do it. Mm -hmm. They just asked the computer. So this time is uh, a key point, and that is a really a deep torture, like uh, that uh, when you always expect that you get freedom in amounts in two months so you are counting days and sometimes that takes for six hours years 10 years nine years so that is the uh, but so time i use this actually in my work a lot for example the film choke up please tell us the time uh the so the the title of the film is about time and that's quite interesting that the film is about uh, uh, like uh, Choka. Choka is a local bird. It's like a native bird that only exists in Manus Island. And uh, Choka is really interesting that Choka, the local people believe that Choka is telling time. So they they just, they say that we don't need watch. We just, when Choka is singing, that means we know that what time is it is, you know? And uh, also Choka is telling news. They interpret it like that. And Choka was a, like a custom, like a, a identity and a symbol of uh, Manusian people. But in the same time, there was a solitary confinement that when they wanted to punish people, they put people there and Australian name it as a Choka. So in this film is about that, you know, that uh, how uh, we have to 
Choka, one ugly choka, which is a solitary confinement, and one is a beautiful choka, which is a bird. Is for and you know I, I that that's come to and also in the book in my words in the articles, uh, I think time, uh, you know, in the second book there is a particular article only about time and how they uh, use the time as a like a. Uh, <laughs> Torture, you know. So, what uh, about the other concepts? So we can talk about it. The other co concept was the, yeah, what, Act yeah. What Act I actually, I, I, I was I was going to uh, jump in and say that um, the especially the issue of um, uh, space and design as weapons. I can I can refer to that in the next part, uh, like in the last couple of minutes, um, especially in relation to Nauru, if you like, Behruz. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, about the space, yesterday I talked about it. So I think most of people here, they were in uh, that session yesterday. So if it's possible, you talk about the design. That is better because of the time, right? Just I, I assume, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure, definitely. But uh, like always, I over-prepared and uh, I, I um, have a, a, way too much material to go through. But I think I'll just finish. Um, by looking at um, the use of design and also, of course, it relates to time and space and identity. But here I'm going to play the trailer to um, a film that's being made by people, uh, especially Elahe and other people who uh, were locked up in Nauru, uh, and which includes, this is a detention centre that includes women, unaccompanied minors, families, uh, and especially because of her background as an architect uh, and an artist, uh, also a journalist. Uh, here we have a, a very distinct, a very acute examination of the way design and space is used as a system of torture. And these are images from the Nauru Detention Centre. And I think what there, there are very distinct differences between what happened in Manus and in Nauru, which we can talk about later on. But, and especially I think here it's important to acknowledge the intersectional nature of the resistance in Nauru, which uh, was led by women and and also involved the the actions, the the work of a lot of um, children too uh, on the island. Um, the journal that Behruz referred to is is here, and the cover art for that was also done by Elahe, who was on Nauru. Now, I'm going to finish off by playing the trailer for the film. Now, what it's important, even though there's no sound, there are subtitles. So you will get a really strong sense of the way that design and space um, in com combination with identity and time are used as um, instruments of torture and how this overarching, this, this all-encompassing, this uh, extremely um, extensive oppressive system also creates the opportunities for refugees to resist. Within these periods, within these phases, within these spaces, there's opportunities for freedom. And I think this is something that hasn't been acknowledged as much or hasn't been focused on, but the refugees actually create unique and um, unprecedented forms of uh, or acts of freedom in their resistance. And I think this Behruz's work and also the trailer to this film that I'm going to show you will really exhibit the way that uh, creative resistance operates and creates new forms of uh, knowledge ecosystems, new ways of uh, new ideas, new concepts, new symbols, new images, new discourses. So I think what uh, what I want to finish off with is this idea that that with um, the uh, the oppression, domination, and suppression that takes place in these particular uh, border zones, refugees actually um, counter that. By, by creating new ways of knowing, new ways of being, new ways of existing, and also new ways of challenging. And it's in, at this point where the refugee, the person who is often depicted in media, in policy, in, in even in academic discourse, is depicted as a victim, as weak, as needy, as someone who just simply needs to be saved. Suddenly, at this point, the refugee, the detained refugee, becomes a knowledge producer becomes an educator, becomes a person that actually knows something about state violence 
about border violence in ways that people with citizen privilege can't access. So here I think I'm going to finish by showing the trailer to the film and we can have a discussion about many of the different dimensions of, of this kind of creative resistance. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Amit, so much. I don't know if you want yeah, to comment. And... Actually, I just uh, wanted to ask Umid if it's possible to show that uh, the first picture, the, those pictures that you uh, got from Manus when you visited Manus. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. So this, uh, uh, the left one, that is quite an interesting. It was about the design, the way the, they use uh, like design to control people and also uh, create a, like a tension uh, and competition between people to have the control of a space, to have a space. That, I think that is a very good example. This place, and also is related to history of Manus as well. This place is like, uh, that they call it uh, P block. And in this small place, uh, 120 people, men, were living for almost uh, three years. So if you look at it, it's just uh, uh, like uh, it's made by like a metal, uh, like iron, the whole uh, place. And 120 people were living in this small place for like uh, more than two years or about three years. 
And this place actually uh, was made on 1951 or two, long time ago, uh, before uh, they, because it is like uh, this um, prison camp was made on a Navy base. So that was for soldiers on that time. So they were using it as a place like that people sleep there or live there. So that is a good example. And also the way they they use the they design the solidarity confinement, like Choco and other uh, cells that when they wanted to punish people, for example, the Choco was uh, the only cell that was out of the prison. It was like 500 meters out of the prison. And when they wanted to punish people, they uh, just, people who didn't follow the rules, they just uh, arrest them and put them in Choka. But Choka was like this and like uh, with like eight uh, container. And uh, so it was a place completely uh, without a window, just it was just a door and two camera was there. So you had to just stay under that that camera alone in a place that was completely white color. So that was uh, I think uh, like Mentoli was really uh, I was there for uh, four days and two two times they put me there, but they uh, yeah. Uh, they banished people there from the prison. So that design was quite interesting, the way they used the container to uh, put pressure on people. And in end of that, you had to sign a letter that, uh, yeah, I accept or I don't do it again. Okay. Yeah. I, I signed that, that's... but later I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> the methods of uh, yeah, yeah. torture. Thank you so much, Omid, for and the bearers for this conversation.